Amen. Sounds good when Jason blows his horn, doesn't it? Amen. All right, kids, come on up. Come on, let's go. Come on up close. Everybody come on up close. I need to ask you, did you have a good Christmas? Yes. Did anybody get anything for Christmas? I did. What did you get? I got a perfume. You got perfume? That's good. That's good. What did you get, Ash? I got two phones. Two phones. Two phones. Okay. All right. What else? Max, what would you get? Got an iPod. What you, What did you get? Jackson got a truck. Good for you. Anybody else get anything good? What'd you get? Jasmine? A piano. A piano. Griggs? Tennis shoes. Tennis shoes. Boy, we got stuff. Olivia, what'd you get? A Furby. A, a Furby? <laughs> all right. All right. What'd you get? A dollhouse. Doll Do you have a doll to go in the dollhouse? Okay, man. I'll tell you, you guys got a bunch of good stuff. The Christmas is over, right? So Christmas is over, and today you hear people saying something that um, I don't know if we know what it means or you know what it means. Do you know what it means when somebody says Happy New Year? What's Happy New Year mean? Today's a new year, so what are you wishing somebody when you say Happy New Year, Jasmine? I'm saying have a happy um, It is. It's 2017. We start a new year. That means this year that if the Lord doesn't come back this year, you'll have another birthday. But you know, the Lord might come back this year. Did you know that? He might come back in 2017. So how many people want to be getting along good with God? How many people want to be knowing they're worshiping God? How many people want to be friends with God? How many people want to know that, that you are God's child in 2017? All right. Now, how many people want to make God happy in 2017? All right. Do you know there's one thing that doesn't make God happy? Do you know what it is? Does anybody know what it is? What is it? Sin. sin. That's exactly right, Emma. Now, what is sin? Yeah, sin is what we do. Griggs, what's sin? Bad, according to me. If I think it's bad or if who thinks it's bad? If God thinks it's bad, right. Sin is when we do something that God says we shouldn't do. Now, have you guys ever done anything that God said you shouldn't do? Anybody here ever done something that you would call sin? Yeah, if you ever talk back to your parents or disrespectful, is that sin? Yeah, if you've ever been mean to somebody... Is that sin? If you've ever said, I hate somebody, is that sin? If you've ever been angry or if you've ever been selfish, is that sin? If you've ever taken something that doesn't belong to you, is that sin? So all these things are out there to do. How in the world can we not sin? It's hard, isn't it? Like, I'm a little bit older than you guys and I try all the time not to sin. And I realize inside of me, there's something sometimes that, it might want to be mean or it might want to do something that God said is wrong. So here's what I, I want to do this new year. This is what I'm asking God to help me with this new year. I'm asking him to tell me in my mind whenever I'm doing something that's wrong. I want to hear it from him, right? Because listen, I'm going to go back out of here and I'm going to be tempted and you're going to be tempted but I need to know that when I'm tempted, I need to know what to do. Does anybody know what temptation means? What's temptation mean? That's when something's in front of you, you know you're not supposed to do, but you want to really do it, right? So I think the easiest way for me to do the things that makes God happy is for me to do what I need to do when I'm tempted. Like if I'm not tempted, if I just sit in this chair and I never leave this room, I won't be tempted. But am I going to sit in this chair and leave this room? 
Yeah, I'm going to get up out of this chair. I'm going to leave. So are you. You're going to go back out of there. What you've got to do is you've got to ask God to help you when you're tempted. Now, if you do something, but nobody sees you do it, and it's wrong, but nobody sees you do it, well, is it still wrong? What do you think? Is it wrong if nobody sees you do it? It is. Why is it wrong? God can see you. He can see through the roof and see you. If you're in your room and you're on the phone with somebody and you tell somebody a lie and nobody knows it but God can see you, it's wrong. God can see you wherever you're at. No, what? Griggs, can he? What were you going to say? He can look at everybody at the same time. So you mean if I hang out with somebody that does a lot more wrong than me, he's not just going to look at him, he could see me too? How can God do all those things? Well, I'll tell you what, if God is always looking at me, look up here, guys, if God is always looking at me, then God must see all those times that I do something wrong, right? Well, if he's there and he can see them, I think my thing to do is to ask him to tell me before I do them. God, tell me with a loud voice that I'm doing something wrong. Tell me with a loud voice that I'm doing something wrong because you're going to have a chance to do something wrong and you're going to need God to tell you. That's called temptation and all of you are going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted to walk by that thing that you say, okay, I know I'm not supposed to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. How about, have you ever wanted to do something and your parents told you that you couldn't do it? And you still did it anyway? And you thought you were hiding? All right. What if your parents don't see you? Is it wrong then? It's still wrong because who sees you? And here's what I want you to leave here with today. I want you to leave here knowing that God sees you no matter what you do. He wants you to be happy with Him. He wants to be happy with you. So know that no matter whenever you begin to think about doing something wrong, who's looking at you? God's looking at you. You're going to be tempted But God's always going to look at you. He's always going to tell you not to do it. You have to listen to him, okay? All right, pray with me. Lord, I love you. I praise you. And I thank you for these children. I pray, God, that as they're tempted in this upcoming year, I pray, God, that you would speak to them so loudly. Lord, lead them and guide them, I pray, so that they can please you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Who would like to have gummies? You want some? I know. Happy birthday. You're welcome. I like your tie. You're welcome. Come on up, get you some. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, how many people have your Bibles today? If you have your Bible, stand up and raise it above your head and bear witness of God's Word. All right, you may be seated. Would you please turn to the book of Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. I want to ask you to answer me this question honestly. In the past year, have there been decisions that you made that you know were wrong decisions? If there is, I'd like you to raise your hand and acknowledge that. All right. I guess I'm just taking a a poll of the audience here. Of those decisions, 
were they all just by chance decision or were any of those things that you did that you knew were wrong, you knew they were wrong before you did them, but you did them anyway, intentionally? Then I'd like you to raise your hand. You bunch of bad people. <laughs> Me too. And then I have a year to look forward to. I'm in church today. You're in church today. You come to worship God. You stand in the presence of God. The Spirit of God, we've asked the Spirit of God to move in this service. We've sang praises to Him. But yet within me, there is the propensity, there is the, the likelihood and the desire within me to do things that are wrong even when I know that they're wrong. And yet I can come back in front of God and say, oh, I worship you, I praise you, I want... And so I don't know about you, but sometimes I almost even, I almost even feel hypocritical. But it makes my praise bigger for God. If there's one thing that I would like to see more this year in myself and in the church body, I would like to see us more active in praising God. Amen. But I don't believe that's going to happen if we really don't see the, the, the level of love that God has for us, the level of forgiveness that he has for us, because it'll just be that thing that's out there that we sort of don't understand. But when you really see that something affects you, then you can praise it. Amen. And so I believe sometimes there's just so many things that occupy our mind and God being one of them that we don't give him the praise that we need to. And then I live in this state of being tempted to sin, giving into that temptation that I don't know that I'm always as right with God as I need to be. So I think my prayer, what I want for the new year, and I think it would be foolish for me to say, God, let me not be tempted at all this year. If I'm going to be alive, I'm going to be tempted. But my prayer would be, God, help me when I am tempted. That would be a fair request to God. If I'm not tempted and pass, then if I don't get tempted, I can't pass the temptation, then I can't please God. It would be like shooting ducks. I mean, there's no, there's no skill to it, right? There's nothing that could please God. Oh, well, hey, you, you did good. What do you mean you did good? Well, I wasn't really tempted. So I think the one thing we have in common is we're going to be tempted. I look back at the story of temptation that happened in the book of Genesis. I thought it was appropriate to speak about today. God had led me to a passage of Scripture in Genesis that, that had to do with, with trees. You think, trees? Yeah, trees. When we think back about the story in Genesis, when sin entered the world, is everybody familiar with that story? The characters here, not hard to remember. How many characters were there? There were two human beings. What were their names? And then you had, and then you had, right. Two human beings, Adam and Eve, Satan, God. When I start talking about trees, and, and, and this is what I want to talk about for today, the, the trees of our life. The trees of our life. And you say, well, not necessarily trees. We're going to look at this story and we know about the tree. Which tree do we think about that messed up everything for us? It, well, the tree of life didn't mess up everything for us. We look at this story and I mean to tell you that this is the way it happens with us. We look at the story, we put it over here in a category. Somebody has shown us a picture from the Bible stories and we read that little blue Bible story book in the doctor's office when we grew up and then we went to Sunday school and we see Eve taking that fruit there and then all of a sudden something hits us. Oh, that was a tree of life and they should have taken that. That was actually not called the tree of life. The tree of life was this tree we don't even talk about. And then there's some other trees. So I want to talk about the trees of our life today. 
I saw something in here I've never seen before, but it actually helped me figure out why I keep going off track. And I look back at my life and I can see, yep, that, that, that's what happened. There's a picture here for us to see. Listen to the story. I want to bring you up to this point, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens of the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the earth. And, and so at this point in time, God began to create. We know that he created for six days, and on the sixth day, he created man. On the seventh day, he rested. And then chapter 2 begins to go in detail of the creation. It actually tells us what our purpose is. How many people here work at a particular place? You are gainfully employed. I'm here to tell you today that your purpose is not where you work. How many people here today are good at some particular thing? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because humble as you are, you won't. You have a particular hobby that brings you enjoyment, but you think, my purpose is to do this. This is what I'm fulfilled. That is not your purpose, right? Your purpose, man was created with the same purpose today as he had. Man was created so God could have fellowship with man. But then a bunch of trees came into the story. Man was created, and the pages of Scripture we see in Genesis 2, all this stuff was created, and then God's to, God begins to be specific. Listen, for example, verse 7, chapter 2. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into the nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Okay, man is here. That's the detail of him creating man. But listen to verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So we see God made a garden. This was a different than all the rest of his creation. This is a distinct garden, the Garden of Eden. It is not all that God created because it tells you that if you go back in this verse, verse 5, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had caused it not to rain upon the earth and there was no man to till the ground, but there went up a mist from earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And then God began to create this garden. We're told at the beginning that there were, there were seeds and, and herbs, there were bushes, there were plants and all these things fed the other animals, so God had a plan. But then in verse 8, he put man in this garden. And then verse 9, it gives us this one verse that I've read hundreds, maybe thousands of times, but I never saw what I was able to see in this. And hopefully it will open your eyes. Listen to this verse. It says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil. <coughs> Trees. Now we're told here about three different groups of trees. You say, oh, hold on. The tree of life, I get that. We don't talk much about the tree of life though, right? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's the one that Eve picked from. What's the other group? Well, listen, I don't think I ever saw this, but it's very, very important. I want you to understand, there are three distinct groups of trees here. The first group we miss, listen, out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Do you realize that in this garden, there were not just two choices of trees, not just the tree of life and not just the tree of Knowledge of good and evil. There was every other tree. Is that important? Oh man, it is important. I want you to see this. We're so vague with this story that we don't think about it, but all those other trees have an impact on those two trees. Every other tree, and I want you to notice about every other tree. What are we told about those trees? Listen. The Bible tells us about them before it begins to ever tell us about the tree of life and tree of knowledge of good and evil. Listen, out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. What are two things we know about all the trees in the Garden of Eden? They're pleasant for sight. What does that mean? That they are enjoyable to what? Look at. And then 
they're good for food. What does that mean? Yeah, they're, they're good to eat. Well, did man need food? Absolutely, man's always needed food. So these trees, all these trees serve two purposes. Number one, you can enjoy them. I, I sit here and I watch these squirrels. There's big oak trees out there. And this squirrel will get in that oak tree and he'll make his nest in that oak tree or burrow down in that, that, that branch. He'll use the leaves of that tree as shade and cover. He'll use the acorn, the fruit of that tree for food. He'll use it as his place to live and go. So he uses that tree. And, and that's the, the, the kind of tree that I'm talking about here. This tree of, of any kind of sort in the Garden of Eden, that was a tree that would sustain your everyday life. It would be something you could enjoy. You could lay down under that tree and think, my, this is a nice place to be. I'm really enjoying this tree. The world's hot. The tree's giving me shade. At the same time, you could say, I like this tree. I'm going to pick the fruit off of this tree because it's good for what? For food. And I need to eat, right? So every other tree offered all these things. There was nothing wrong with those trees. They were in the Garden of Eden, for crying out loud. Then we're told, after that, that there was the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So three groups of trees. The tree of life, which we don't talk about much, but we're going to today. The tree of life was planted by God, as it says here. But something distinct about the, the tree of life. The tree of life was planted in the middle of the garden. I don't think I ever noticed that it said in the midst of the garden, but translation doesn't mean it was planted somewhere among the trees. This midst actually means middle. So of all God's garden of Eden, the tree of life, was in the middle. What's important about the tree of life? Well, the tree of life was different. That's why it was identified as different. It was different from all the other trees. The other trees would let you enjoy what you wanted to see, right? And it would let you enjoy being full, which you felt like was a necessity. The tree of life was different because the life that it gave was eternal life. Do you realize that Adam and Eve, at this point, as long as they went to the tree of life and took from the tree of life, they had eternal life. You won't really learn this until you learn that the curse took that away. So the tree of life, go to the tree of life every day. Pick me off some of the fruit of the tree of life. Guess what it's going to give me? It's going to give me assurance that I'm going to live forever. As long as I take of this tree, take of this tree, what am I going to do? Live forever. The other trees, they can help me live for that day. That tree can help me live forever. That's what distinctly makes it the tree of life. It's the tree of eternal life. Then we have another tree. The other tree is the one that we focus all of our stories about. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but we don't like to say that many words. So one tree is the tree of life. Let's call the other tree the tree of death. One's the tree of life. What's the other tree? The reason we call it the tree of death is because verse 15 and 16, listen to what God told Adam after he put Adam in the garden. Now remember, he told Adam this before Eve was even created. The Lord God took the man and put him into the garden, verse 15, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest of it thou shalt surely what? Die. Die. The tree of life, if you eat of it, you get eternal what? Life. If you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you get what? Death. death. Life, death. Seems like an easy choice to make, right? When we look and know how the story comes out, we can honestly say, you mean to tell me all of that was so evident to them, the big booming voice of God said, don't eat of this tree. But yet, as a Christian, we know that's where sin began because Eve took of the fruit, right? And she ate of that. And then she gave it to Adam and he ate, even though God said, hey, this tree will bring death. I wonder sometimes, I, I think sometimes as Christians, we sort of look from a distance and we don't look down deep in because 
in my mind, if I'm looking down deep in, I would think to myself, how could two people be so naive to bring a curse on the world when God had clearly told them? But then when I looked a little deeper, I saw that it wasn't as simple as we look at it. Yes, Satan did convince Eve to take the fruit. But there were a lot of other factors here. You know what the factors were? The factors were the other trees. You see, when I look at Satan's explanation, the temptation, if you will, the temptation of Satan, well, in no way did Satan try to tempt Eve by saying that that tree of knowledge of good and evil was not evil. Listen to Satan's temptation of Eve, or Eve's temptation by Satan. Now the serpent, chapter 3, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. So, hold on a second. Not only was the tree of life in the middle of the garden, what other tree was in the midst of the garden? The tree of death was in the garden. So let's stop right here. I want you to get a visual picture that we fail to look at. You had a garden of Eden full of many trees. Those trees had two distinct uh, things that we know about them. They were what? They were pleasant to look at, beautiful. You could enjoy being around them, enjoy them. Number two, good to eat. You needed them to, to get through that day. So here we have all those trees. You have to get to the middle to get to the tree of life, to have eternal life, not just everyday life. And then when you get to that tree of life in the middle, there's another tree that's in the middle also. Life's full of trees. Life's full of choices. This Garden of Eden, when I saw this picture, I thought to myself, oh my, oh me. Here's what's happened to me. You know, I think the devil's convincing of Eve, it, it plays into the same thing that we have, that the, I guess the, the insecurities that we have, what we want. I, in saying that, I want you to understand that the devil tempted Eve in these ways. First of all, he lied to Eve and he said, hey Eve, you, you're not surely going to die. This was his explanation. It was one verse. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Is this important? It's very important. Here's why. The devil didn't try to convince Eve that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was not a tree that she shouldn't take. He tried to convince Eve that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was just like all the other trees. Why is that important? Well, if you're living in the same society I am today, you'll see that the devil hasn't changed his plan at all. The devil never approaches you and say, this is wrong, go do it. He says, this tree that's wrong, it's no different than any of the other trees. The other ones that you pass by, the ones that are pleasant for food, the ones that are pleasant to look at, the ones that you're need. This tree is no different. It's just that God knows if you take of this tree, then you're going to know everything that he knows. He's just trying to keep you down. He's trying to keep you from knowing this. Eve bought it. Why did she buy it? Because Eve had in her what we have in us. The Bible well, it, it says it this way. In John, the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verse 16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All those things are of the world, it says, but they're not of the Father. How was Eve tempted? Well, this verse tells you in Genesis 3 when the woman saw that the tree was good for food 
that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and she did eat, and gave it unto her husband, and he did eat. What did she see? She saw that it was pleasant to the eyes, right? She saw that it was good for food. Hold on a second. Isn't that the description that we were given for every other tree in the garden? The trees we never talk about. All the other trees. The trees that weren't bad. God put them in the, the garden for man to dress and to keep it. Hey, every now and then, Adam, pick you an apple off of this tree. Pick you a fig off of this tree. They're good for food. They're pleasant. Look at the leaves. Eve was tempted. Eve failed in her temptation because Eve put the evil tree in the same category as every other tree. This is big. She said it was pleasing to look at and that it was good for food. But then she went a step further. In our description of why she took the fruit, the Bible tells us Satan told her if you take it, then your eyes will be open, you'll be like God's. She took it so that she could be smarter, wiser, and more than she was. There was only two of them. It wasn't like she wanted to be smarter, wiser than her neighbor. There was a sense inside of her that says, I want to be more than what I am. I want to be. Because she fell for exactly what the devil said. So why, how does this apply to us today? Well, I'm watching today the same world that you're watching. You know, I see the things that have happened this year. And if I look back 10 years, I would say there is no way in the world that the human race is so ignorant they would fall for these things that we blatantly for thousands of years have known are wrong. We, we sat and discussed a bathroom ordinance which allowed women and men to go in the same bathroom, little girls to be okay to go with men. And people said, oh, it's because you have to allow it. Think about what we're saying. Has it always been wrong to know that you're, you're putting those two together? Are men different than women? We've sat and said, hey, listen, it's okay for a man to be with a man and a woman to be with a woman. You don't need to, even though we know that, that society would fail if that was the norm. There's no reproduction between male and male. You'd be signing the death warrant of society. And if you're smart enough to pick up an anatomy book, it would go even further and say, hmm, this must not be right. And then we can say, okay, if it gets too crowded, here's what we'll do. We'll kill the babies. How can we get to that, that way of thinking? Here's why. Not because we look at it as evil. We look at it the same as we look at every other tree. You see, it's these other trees. These other trees that aren't technically wrong. Do you know that you've got to walk by every other tree to get to the tree of life? God specific. Where did he put it? Think about it. No matter where I come to, from the garden. I've got to walk by all these other trees. That are not technically wrong. Nothing wrong with a tree of, of success or financial prosperity. That tree makes me feel good, right? That tree lets me eat. But do you know that if I choose to stay at that tree, I'll never make it to the middle where the tree of life is? Well, what about those other trees? Here's the tree of pleasure. I want to lay down under this tree because I like doing this. This is what I like to watch. This is what I like to do. This is where I'm going to get stuck. This is my hobby or this is where I go. So I'm going to pour myself and I'm going to stay in this tree. Well, if you stay at that one tree, you'll never make it to the tree in the middle. That's the tree you have to get to. You see, you'll have something for the everyday life that you think makes you happy, but you're lulled into the lie that the devil is telling you that keeps you from the middle tree. That's the only one that's going to give you eternal life. Do you see how... Beautiful, this picture of the trees are. I, I missed it my whole life. And then when I get to the tree of life, well, it's not just easy then. There's a tree right beside of it. 
that tree looks good too. That tree tells me you're too smart to accept something that old preacher up at Nazareth is talking about. He says that you can have fellowship with God. He says that one day God will have you in his presence and he says that you can live forever. That's what he's saying. The Bible says you're smarter than that. Listen, you believe in God. You go out and do your good works. You do what you think God would have you pleased with. And you're smarter than to think that God just created all this thing. And listen, there's so many things of the Bible that you can dispute. Listen, that's no different than the lie that that Eve believed when it says, hey, you're going to be as wise as God. Do you know why man fails to come to God? Because man thinks he is wise enough to get what he wants another way. That's the pride of life. You know why else man doesn't come to God? The lust of the flesh. What he wants to do that thinks it makes him feel good. And the lust of the eyes. That's everything that we see on those trees that stop us from getting to the middle. How pretty is that picture? How horrible is that picture? I spent a lot of years trapped in the trees. Not really doing anything wrong. But I'm going to tell you, friend. If you stop at that tree and bask in it, even in the name of saying, okay, listen, this is, this is the tree I'm pouring into. It's the tree that, that I enjoy. My first priority is, is spending all my time with my family. So that's what I'm going to do. Is there anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. But if you stay at that tree, then you or your family are not going to get to the tree of life. Yes, you had your family while you're on this earth. Hope you enjoyed it. If I stop at that tree that says, this is my pleasure, this is my hobby, I'm going to pour all my time into it, I think about it, I'm, everything, it makes me happy, this is what I do, and, and, and so this is what I'm going to pour my time into. And I stop at that tree and I bask in it and I lay under the leaves of that tree and I eat the fruit of that tree because it gives me this temporary gratification. I'll never get to the middle tree. That's good. Nothing's wrong with my hobby nothing's wrong with it but it stops me from getting to the middle do you get what i'm saying if i sit and say hey listen i know that i've got to support my family and work for it or i know that i need to to be financially secure so i'm going to take a job that's going to take me away from church and i know that i need to be focusing on god but listen this is what defines my life and this is what i'm going to have and this is what i've got to do then we convince ourselves no differently than eve was convinced that one of these other trees is just like the tree of life but it's not It wasn't such a bad thing. There was nothing wrong in doing that. But when it comes to be the thing that keeps us from going past that tree or moving out from underneath it and getting to the only tree that can give you three things, everlasting life, fellowship with God, and standing in the presence of God. And do you know that when the curse came on these two, that's exactly what happened? Eve took of the fruit Listen to what the curse involved. This is chapter 3, verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thee shalt eat of it all day long, all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread. Listen, till you return unto the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, out of the dust thou art, and out of the dust shall, you shall return. Was man made out of the dust of the earth? He was. Guess what? For the first time in man's life, he is seeing something that's regrettable. Of the dust you shall return? Guess what's going to happen to man? He's going to die. He is going to die. That's part of the curse. Part of the curse is that the sin came into the world. Man's eyes were open. See, until this, man was innocent. There was one law in the earth. Was it do not steal? No. Nope. Was it do not kill? Was it do not commit false, uh, uh, do not um, commit adultery? Do not bear false witness. We could go to, was it any of those? One law. Guess what the law was? Do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
Here's the punishment. You'll be cursed. You're going to die. Listen to the extent of the curse. Number one, the curse brought sin into the world. Man was innocent till this point. God told him what was right and wrong. Everything is right except for this one tree. When man took that tree, then man began immediately to have a conscience that would go along with his sin nature. That meant that men, even up to me and you, had the propensity to sin. What do you mean? Immediately when man sinned, he hid himself. When God came through the garden, you read this, and we're not going to go over everything, but you read this, and God called to him. What were they doing? Somebody tell me. And then when they came out, God said, what are you dressed in? Well, we sewed fig leaves together because we were naked. Who told you you were naked? Hold on a second. They had knowledge of good and evil. That came from the curse of sin. From that point on, they had knowledge. Before then, it was, Eden was a nudist colony and it was okay. Why? Why? Well, there's no sin, there was no lust, there was no bad thought, there's nothing. Then all of a sudden, naked, right? Come on now. In the, in, the, in the thought, right? What happened? Man's heart changed. It's part of the curse. Then, listen to the rest of the curse. Listen to the end of this verse. Therefore, Verse 22, and the Lord God said, behold, the man has now become like one of us to know good and evil. Now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence it was taken. So he drove out the man. Last verse in chapter three. He drove out the man. Drove him out of where? Somebody tell me. And he placed at the end of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Some people would say, okay, listen, let me understand this. God put a cherubim there. He put this holy being there so that man could still get back to the tree of life. No, don't miss it. He put it so man could never get to the tree of life. Don't forget the verses we read here. It says the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. Where was the tree of life? In the middle of what? You say, this is over punishment. They just chose the wrong tree. Listen, it was intentional. God knows what intentional sin is. Eve, as a matter of fact, Eve was told by Adam, God said, if you eat of that tree, you're going to die. Eve was told even more by Adam that God didn't even say. God just said, don't eat of it. You know what Eve told the devil? God said that we can't eat of it, we can't even touch it. You know what Adam had told her? Don't go near that tree. Don't go near it. You can't even touch it. Don't even look at it. Don't touch it. Don't anything. But she looked at it. Eyes. She saw that it was something that she wanted. She touched it. Mmm. I like that. Let me eat it. Looks like it's good for food. Then once she did it, she shared it. And he did it. Everything changed. And God said, because of this, I have to make sure you can't get back to this tree of life. You say, that's over punishment. I want you to understand something even deeper. God thinks way deeper than us. Adam and Eve at this point were sinners, right? They had sinned. They had a sin nature. If God allows them to get back to the tree of life and keep taking that tree of life, do you know how long Adam and Eve live? They'd still be living today. There would be no chance for Adam and Eve to ever come completely clean. There would be no chance for them to ever escape their sin nature. There would be no chance for them to ever come into the presence of God because if they're living forever, they're able to get to the Garden of Eden, but they have sin and God has no sin. Man is forever separated from God at that point because man never dies. God was gracious in saying, listen, you're going to return to the dust because I've got a plan that I'm going to implement after that. Well, what did God do? Well, God said, listen, I know the shape you're in. My intention was for me to have fellowship with you. You're banned from the Garden of Eden. You can't get to the tree of life. You messed up with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And all these other trees, they just get in your way. Listen, I'm going to bring a new tree into your life. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5.
What is the purpose of this new tree he's going to bring into, God's going to bring into their life? Let me tell you the purpose of this new tree. The new tree is here to reverse the curse. I want you to tell the person beside of you, the new tree will reverse the curse. Reversing the curse. What's the curse? Let me see again. The curse of sin that separates me from God. The curse of death that means I can't live forever. That curse takes me out of the presence of God because God can have nothing to do with sin. And that curse, it means that I can't fellowship with God on a daily basis when he comes walking in the garden. So this tree he's going to give us is going to reverse the curse. Why? Why would God do this? This is our reason we praise Him. We get back to what we need to do. Praise God more. Why are we going to praise Him? Romans 5, 8 says, God loves you. God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, just like our parents, Adam and Eve, Christ died for you. Amen. What did I do for it? Nada. Nothing. What can I do for it? Nothing. Nothing. God loved you so much. Listen, he goes on. He says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's big, guys. That's big. You know what that means? That means that, yes, in the garden, we were separated from God. We were banished from the garden of Eden. Eternal life was taken away from us. Why? Because sin was intentionally chosen. And God said, I want them to be with me. There's only one way for them to be with me. To reconcile means bring together in love and fellowship. I love that word reconciled and Paul used it. There's only one way. We're going to have to take someone that is righteous. Well, could they have taken me if I lived back then? No, could they have taken Blake, Tanya, Greg? No, Don, Jason? No, couldn't have taken us. Why? Because we've sinned. This is what's so neat. The only only way that we could get back to God was if God could have someone righteous who walked through the garden of life but never yielded to temptation who could that be this is the end of that chapter 5 it says verse 16 and not as it by one that sin so is the gift for the judgment was to the condemnation but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification that might sound complicated listen to verse 17 Chapter 5 of Romans. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, that's Adam, right? Much more, they which receive abundance of grace of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Verse 21, that as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign unto righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. We know it like this in these verses. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. We know it by these verses. For the wages of sin is death. If we stayed in our sinful state, what do you get? The tree of death, the curse of death, which is separation from God, never being in God's presence, not being in his fellowship, and death. Eternal death, spiritual death, physical death. But the gift of God, hold on a second, we're going to reverse the curse, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, right? God so loved His Son, He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. That's way different than the curse, right? So this tree reverses the curse. How can He do it? This is the way the book of Hebrews says it. In Hebrews chapter 2, I want to read to you a couple of verses. This is verse 14 through 18. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise 
took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him and the power of death, that is the devil, talking about Jesus here, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's what Jesus did for us. He became sin. He became our sacrifice for sin, even though he had never sinned. Let me read the rest of it. You see, we're in bondage to what Adam and Eve done until Jesus. For ver verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. That means Jesus became a man so that he could walk through that same garden of life that we walk in, be tempted like we're tempted, but then not sin. He became righteous. You say, well, Adam and Eve were righteous before they took of the tree. They were not. They were innocent before they took of the tree. There's a difference between innocence and righteousness. Innocent, we can relate to Adam and Eve because they only had God to listen to. They were innocent because if they wanted to know if something was right and wrong, they would say, God, is it right or wrong? They were innocent of what was right and wrong. Once they took of that, then they knew right and wrong. Then they had a sin nature. Then the word righteousness came in. Righteousness is when we're innocent. Excuse me. Righteousness is when temptation is present, but we remain sinless. That's righteousness. Amen. If there's no temptation there, you can't be righteous. Jesus was righteous. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 15, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with feelings of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, yet he's without sin. Right now, something should be gearing up inside of you as your reason to praise the Lord. Not just that you're here at church and I wonder how long it's going to be. Look, it's about this time. We should have about this much left. No, it's that Jesus loved you and he saves you from the curse of death. If that doesn't get you stirred up, he saved your children from the curse of death. How about that? Amen. How? He sent another tree. But just because that tree is there, I want to turn it back around. Because the tree is there, it doesn't save you. You have to take of the fruit of the tree. Because the tree of life was there, it did not mean that Adam and Eve kept life, right? They took something else. Because Jesus lived and died, was buried and resurrected, because that tree of life is there, does that mean... That you're going to go to heaven and be in the presence of God? Does that mean that you can have fellowship with God now? Does that mean that you're going to have eternal life? No. You have to take of him for all those things to happen. You can't just have somebody say, they're good. You've been a good guy. Listen, say these couple of things and you're going to be fine. You can't go through a, the process of some kind of class and somebody say, okay, now you've passed it and you're good. I did all those things. Maybe some of you have done those things. Paul said it this way. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What is the fruit of the tree that you have to take? Jesus is the tree. The fruit is the gospel. Amen. You take that fruit, which is the death, burial, and resurrection, and you put it way down inside of you you own it you believe it it's in you and then you live by it Hallelujah. Glory. you see jesus is able to reverse the curse he gives you the opportunity to come to this new tree of life he invites you to come he says come to me all you that labor and are heavy laden and i'll give you rest take my yoke upon you learn of me he wants us to he said, he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. Hey, listen, I want you to reach forth and I want you to take me. Take me, take me. All through the Bible, Jesus compels us. Take me. Come to the fountain. Take me. Come on now. We were doomed 
doomed. If we would have stopped right where, where we finished a minute ago in the Garden of Eden, separated from God, no hope of the future, not going to live forever, out of fellowship with God, never see the presence of God, that would be the worst sermon I could ever preach, but praise God it didn't stop right there. We have something to praise God about. What we praise God about is that he had a New Testament tree. And that tree has fruit that you have to take. Now get this. It's not just like that's your only choice. You see, that garden is the same garden we walk in today. It's not the Garden of Eden, believe me. But the picture is so clear. I have an opportunity every day to go and have fellowship with God. You say, well, what about God's presence? You're in God's presence? I'm not in God's presence. You say, we came to church to be in God's presence. We've got songs written about it. You're in the spirit. You're in the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. One day you'll stand in the presence of God Almighty. Amen. Jesus will reverse the curse that way. Now you're in his, you can have fellowship with him now. You can speak to him now. But God is in heaven and we are here. Well, that creates a dilemma. I'm here with all these other trees. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, in your Christian life, it's not those big evil trees that get in your way. We'll stand up here to, together and we'll look in the Bible and say, yes, sir, pastor, I know that's wrong. I'm never going to believe that. I'm never going to be like that. Good. It's not those trees that are getting us, guys. It's all the other trees that are good for food and pleasing to look at that are not technically wrong. It's just they're stopping us from getting to that middle tree. We're staying over here on the edge. Oh, we know that tree's in there. Right now, we're just enjoying where we're at in life. I got all these friends around me. I got all these things I'm enjoying. Man, this feels good. This is pleasing to my eye right here where I'm at. I, I've got this thing that I enjoy doing. I got this place that I enjoy going. I got these people that I enjoy being around. I'll get there. I'll get there. I'm just still out here. I'm enjoying one of these other trees. It's these other trees that have tripped me up, that have tripped you up. You can't technically say anything's wrong with them, but what becomes wrong with them is that they stop you from getting to the middle tree. It's not so much about that tree of knowledge of good and evil they took of as it is all these other trees. I've got them in my life and you've got them in yours. We justify ourselves from getting to the middle tree to communicate and fellowship with God by saying we're not really doing anything wrong. But in essence, we've stopped in life on our journey because we found something that satisfies us. So we're not seeking anymore. Did you read the sign out there for this new year? Boy, the best piece of advice that I can give anybody is seek God this year and you'll praise God this year. Amen. Absolutely. You quit seeking him and get tied up on that tree, whatever it is. It might be your hobby, your pleasure. Might be a person in your life. Might be something that you can completely justify. Well, that tree is not going to give you the peace and fellowship of God. That tree is not going to give you the satisfaction of life. It's not going to give you eternal life. You got to get to the middle. So I don't think I ever saw the importance of the trees. And then I look in the book of Revelation as the words of Scripture ends. And here's Jesus again speaking. He's saying, listen up. Watch. <laughs> listen up. Listen. I'm going to proclaim it. He says, he that hath an ear, let him hear. <laughs> listen up. This means listen. Listen to this one little phrase. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh. I will give to eat of the tree of life, Amen. which is in the midst of the paradise of God. When you get to Revelation 22 and it talks about heaven the way that we're going to know it in the new Jerusalem, there is a tree of life that is there. And it describes that tree of life. Listen, 
The rivers flow from it. That tree of life is Jesus. He is the never-ending well that quenches man's thirst. The tree of life came back onto the pages of Scripture. You never heard anything about it. Man was banished from it. Couldn't get to it, but praise God. He sent another tree. If I to sum up my life, I, I, I've been in, in the middle of all these trees. I asked you at the beginning of this sermon, have you ever made wrong choices? Have you made wrong choices this year? I want you to get the picture in your mind. You'll have choices of trees to choose this year. Some of them won't be wrong. Some of them, there's nothing wrong you can say about them. But if they keep you from being in fellowship with God, they are wrong. If they keep you from getting to the middle where the tree of life is that Jesus represents in the gospel, they are wrong. It could be the tree of wealth. It could be the tree of hobby. It could be the tree of slothfulness. You could even equate it to say nothing is wrong with rest. If you're resting just from church but not from work, not from hobby, not from pleasure, take that up with God. I'm just saying, we've overlooked these other trees because it's been convenient for us to overlook these other trees. The other trees are going to be there this year. You can enjoy them. You can eat of them. They can be pleasant for your eye. But don't stay under them to keep you from getting to the middle where the presence of God is going to be. Amen? He's prepared the tree of life for you. He watched his son Jesus die. The fruit that Jesus has is the gospel. It's his life, the righteous one that died for you. Today, you have an opportunity to take of that tree. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, I want to beg you right now. Listen, consider this. You don't have to be a bad person. You can be a distracted person. Maybe it's the lust of your eye, the lust of the flesh. Maybe it's the pride of life. We all have it in us. It doesn't make you some terrible person. It makes you a person. A person needs to get to that tree. Jesus is there with the gospel. He says, if you confess with your mouth that I am Jesus, believe in your heart that I died for you, I was buried, I rose from the dead, that is your means of salvation, you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the curse. Why? Jesus says, I reverse the curse. And if you're a Christian today and you've been to that tree of life and you've taken that gospel and you've put it inside of you, God, help us to be aware of how we're living for him, knowing we've used him to reverse the curse. There are years of my life I made a mockery of him. He reversed my curse, gave me eternal life, gave me fellowship with God. I chose not to use that fellowship because I was too busy to pray. I chose not to be able to hear him speak because I didn't have time to read my Bible. I chose not to be in his presence and, and feel the spirit of God in his presence because I had things more important than coming to church and worship and praising him. And I chose to live my life outside in those other trees whenever he had given me the tree of eternal life, knowing that I was going to get it eventually. I made a mockery of him staying out in these other trees. And I'm sorry for that. And when he showed me that in this, I got on my knees and I asked him to forgive me. And now he tells it to you. And where do you find yourself? Do you want to be right with God this new year? Amen. Then the picture is so clear and so simple. It's you and the trees. Which one are you standing at? Which one would God say you're standing at? Are you there? The tree of life, that's what it's all about. Are you hung up on some other one? Are you still taken from the, the wrong one? If you're in one of those positions today. You figure out where you're at. God's will, willing to listen, ready to listen right now. You'll start your, near, your new year off right in the fellowship of God. So pray with me. Father God, I love you. I praise you. I thank you for this time you give us to worship you. I thank you for your message. I thank you, God, that you show us a picture in these trees. Lord, I've never seen it. I praise you for it. Lord, show us ourselves today. I pray, God, that Christians all over this room, Lord, they cry back out to you, Lord, when we see where we're at. Lord, if there are those that are here 
that are walking with you, standing with you, Lord, feeling the peace that comes from being right beside of you. I pray, God, that their prayers coat the way for everyone else that's here as they kneel before you today, Lord, just receive their praise, receive their gratefulness for loving them. Lord, for those today that may be in, in another part of the garden of life, they're hung up with some other tree, Lord. There's nothing really wrong with it except that it's keeping them from you. I pray, God, show them who they are today. And as they ask for forgiveness, Lord, point them the way to you. Reach your hand out. I know you want them to come. Lord, for those today that have never been to the middle of the garden, where they've never accepted your son Jesus as Savior, I pray, God, today they would see their need for salvation. They would confess their sin to you. They would ask for the salvation that Jesus can give them. I pray for their salvation today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Page I really appreciate you coming as we leave here today. I'm, I hope God has painted a picture in your mind. I have to share something with you as a parent. I know we have our kids going back to high school and going back to college. And the thing that I just kept on seeing through this whole thing, it, it wasn't the way the sermon was directed. But I, I kept looking at, at my role as a, as a parent. I kept seeing that 
these kids, like even the kids going back to college and high school after this break is over, they're basically just going back out among the trees. And me as a parent, I sit and I say, don't, don't stay at that tree, don't stay at that tree, don't stay at that tree, get to the main tree. That's, and it sounds like I'm just harping on it and harping on it. When you're telling your children this, tell them why. If you've been there before, don't be ashamed to admit it to them. Tell them that there's nothing technically wrong with something that they're doing but that it will keep them from the Lord. They're going to go back out and there's trees that are just waving their branches for them to stay and spend time with. As they go to college, it's almost like we give them a rite of passage that says, okay, go and and do this. Listen, we can't do that. We have to always be clear to tell them, this is where your happiness, your peace is going to be. So as they go back, send them back with your prayers. Send them back. I've loved having them. I've loved them being here while they're on break. And I'm just saying, I kept seeing a picture of just the world out there. I want to sit and tell all of them, that, listen, don't stay under this tree, don't stay under this tree, but it's ultimately going to be their choice. So I just pray that the voice of God is just speaking loud. They're not going to hear that voice of God if you don't bring them in front of it. That's right. Keep bringing them in front of it. This year, keep bringing them in front of it. All right? You say, my child's young. Your child won't stay young. Ask some of these people around here that are experiencing that. They don't stay young. Keep them in church. Bring them under the sound of the word. Let God speak to them. Because one day it's going to be just them out among them trees. Your voice isn't going to be there. I love you guys. I appreciate just the opportunity to worship with you today. I love you. Will you dismiss us in prayer? Hold on a second before you do. Anybody doing anything at 6 o'clock tonight? You're coming to church. Anybody else coming to church tonight? Hey, you don't want to miss tonight. 6 o'clock. Be here, okay? All right, thank you.